Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Road channel. I was going to do a retrospective of 2023 since this will be the last video of the year, but I just wasn't inspired. Instead, I decided to do something completely different. Now, I rarely do reviews of nonfiction books, but this one is appropriate because it involves a couple things that are very important to me. Animation, which I've always loved, and I've reviewed some on this channel, and the creative process, because this book gives a fair bit of insight into that. And as a writer, that is very important to me. Now, the actual topic of this book is one of the world's preeminent animation studios, Pixar. The name of the book is Creativity Inc. Overcoming the Unseen Forces That Stand in the Way of True Inspiration by Edwin Catmull. This is a fascinating behind the scenes look at the company that bought us Woody and Buzz Lightyear, <laughs> among other great characters. And it gives some important insight into how this startup company survived its rough years at the beginning to become the hit factory that kept churning out brilliant film after brilliant film year after year. A lot of you may not have heard of Ed Catmull. His name is not exactly a household word, but I think it is in the world of animation because he has been or was, until his retirement recently, was the head of the mighty Pixar. <laughs> and ostensibly this book is about, besides Pixar's history, is about the lessons it can give to management science. Unlike a lot of business books, however, it is long. It is long and involved and it covers a lot of topics. So I'm going to review this by topic. These aren't really divide, divided into hard and fast sections necessarily, but I'm going to do this for the purpose of considering it. It's funny, there's a trope about business books that they're supposed to be short, pithy, and inspirational. And the side effect is that you forget about them a month later. <laughs> I know, because I've read a lot of them. This is not that kind of book. Ed Catmull was always obsessed with Disney animation growing up in the 1950s in America. And he originally wanted to be an art student and got into computer science instead, which is a kind of an odd career path. Really in his career, he got into the graphics industry, which is being promoted by DARPA, the Defense Department that is, which also founded the internet. And uh, he either invented or pioneered or co-invented co a lot of the uh, animation technologies that I'm going to talk about in the section on technology. He graduated from the University of Utah in 1969. And it's amazing how many uh, graphics pioneers and computer, computer industry pioneers came from there. Maybe it's a Mormon thing. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, Catmull ended up joining Lucasfilm uh, shortly after the big success of Star Wars uh, in... Uh, the 1970s, he had his graphics group that he started in 1979, that is Lucas did, and uh, it was his dream job. <laughs> and they did a lot with early computer graphics, even though a lot of it was still practical effects at the time. Uh, now, it got into a little bit of trouble after Lucas's divorce, and he had to unload this asset. So that led to the founding of Pixar. Now they also brought on a lot of early uh, pioneers from Disney, you know, brilliant minds that, uh, for example, John Laster, who pitched the idea of the Brave Little Toaster, which is considered a classic, he was fired for pitching it. <laughs> it just shows you how unimaginative Disney was at the time. The name Pixar supposedly came from one of the early founders, Alvy Ray Smith, who was from Texas. And he thought of it as a fake Spanish verb, because all Spanish verbs end in R in the infinitive form. So Pixar, to make pictures. I thought that was pretty cool, being from Arizona anyway. And so there was also the intervention of Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computer, who helped 
keep Pixar from going bankrupt. He's an important part of the story, and so I'll talk more about him as this goes on. Now here are the different themes, and I'm going to go through these one by one and my reaction to them. Theme number one, the technology. As we say, this really made me geek out. <laughs> I was enjoying it tremendously because I'm a computer guy. I was into computer graphics early on, and this guy was in at the beginning when the bus left the station. Uh, this was, uh, you know, the DARPA stuff and technologies like texture mapping, spatial anti-aliasing, beast blinds, Z buffering, tweening, that is an animation, and the all-important alpha channel. Now, this may not mean anything to most of you, but to somebody who's in computer graphic, these are foundational technologies. And uh, at the same time that he was at Lucasfilm, Lucas in, uh, acquired Cadabrascope from Nolan Bushnell, another Utah guy who had founded Atari. So they got some of their tech with that. And interestingly enough, it was originally a hardware company because Lucas had his own you know, hardware computer that his group was building. And so when it became Pixar, it was called the Pixar Image Computer. And that was never very successful. They were trying to sell it to companies for you know, computer-aided design, but it just never really took off. But what was successful was their software. At Lucasfilm, it was called RAIS, an acronym for Render Everything You Ever Saw. And at Pixar, it became the Pixar Render Man software, which is like the gold standard for computer animation. Theme two, the company. Now, here's where we get into a lot of business technology, you know, business term terminology and motivational stuff and things about you know, managing people, which is not really my thing. I've never really been a boss. <laughs> Maybe now in my later life, when I become more patient, I might be able to, but I have still no inclination. So Pixar was early on, they adopted some of the technologies that were being adopted by Toyota, which was a big deal in like the 1980s. Everybody was exclaiming about how Japanese car companies had brought quality into the picture. You know, in the 1960s, when I was growing up, the words made in Japan meant garbage. <laughs> and they changed it around. Now made in Japan means quality, usually expensive quality. <laughs> <laughs> and Toyota had this philosophy that every employee should have input and that even the lowliest worker on the assembly line should be able to stop the line if he saw a problem. And uh, they wanted to incorporate this into Pixar. And so they had that, those kind of management uh, communications, open communications ideas. And they also had a lot of Steve Jobs's very interesting ideas because he came in and saved them from bankruptcy by investing. And he actually designed their early campus, trying to make it open and uh, facilitating that people would talk and uh, mingle and exchange ideas. He even tried to limit the number of restrooms so that people would be forced to see each other, uh, which they nixed. They said, no, we're not going to have two restrooms for the entire building. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, the meeting room layouts were a major part of this because as they did these meetings, they found that people felt excluded if they were out on, you know, the they were out of the main part where the table is. So they had to make the, the table so it would kind of accommodate everybody and that people would feel like they could speak up and be heard. Originally, when they were first struggling, they had a group of the founders who got together every couple months to debate on ideas and throw out concepts and they would often get very emotional but they would always do it in a friendly fashion later dubbed the dream <laughs> this was later dubbed the brain trust and they sought input from all departments from people in every walk of life including the janitors <laughs> they had the idea of creative freedom and uh because they would do notes, what is called in the film industry, but the idea is they weren't mandatory. Uh, you could take them as recommendations. They also had the policy that sequels would be good as the original. 
A lot of companies phone them in, basically. They say, okay, we've got a built-in audience. We're not going to worry about this. We're going to make it just quick and dirty. No, they want to do this much of a quality in every one. And yet they also said, we don't want to do all sequels. We want to make sure that that's no more than one third of our output. Everything else is supposed to be original. Eventually, the company was bought by Disney and they had a lot of negotiation to make sure they would be autonomous and they could keep their unique management structure that was very open to you know, individuality and, and employee perks and so on. They even had their own swimming pool, the lucky ducks. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, Catmull at the time became head of both divisions, uh, Pixar and the Disney Animation Group. And uh, it was interesting to see how this worked. And they eventually got some of Pixar's good ideas into Disney, which had become very, very stultified and bureaucratized. So at the very end of the book, Catmull has a lot of these pithy business proverbs that he's kind of collected. And uh, if you had the print version, you can, you know, copy it, put it on your wall <laughs> to inspire you if you're in a cubicle somewhere. Topic three is the content. And I was really thrilled with this too as a fanboy. Uh, Pixar made some of the greatest animation ever, and I've seen many of them. And uh, according to Wikipedia, there have been 26 full-length movies. At least I think this is only the full-length movies. They've been a lot of shorts, too. And I have seen eight of them. <laughs> and this was mostly when my kid was young and my sister's kids were young and so on. And yet, there are animations, there are animated movies where you go with your kid and you fall asleep because they're so boring. <laughs> because they're not good movies. They're just for the kids. But these never. I was always really fascinated and captivated. Pixar always had this emphasis on technology on doing the best with their computer animation and doing the best job of detail and uh, true to life look and feel. Of those 26 movies on the list, I have seen eight. Uh, all, be, all of them before 2009, including Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, Monsters Inc., Finding Nebo, The Incredibles, one of my favorites, Wall-E, and Up. And it was just cool, you know, hearing about hearing about how they did this and the history of each of those movies, all the changes they went through, the characters they added, that they deleted, the uh, scenes they added to bring emotional tension, and so forth. This brings me to topic number four, the creative process. Pixar was always a big believer in whimsy, that is having fun, you know, and they encouraged individuality. Workers could decorate their, you know, office space, their desk with their own pictures and so on. And, uh, to make the office a fun and inviting place. They also tried to encourage confidence. They said, all of our movies suck at first, which is true for us authors. All of our books suck at first. The early versions are, are not good unless you're some kind of genius. And even when you are, you know, you have to iterate. You have to make them better and change it and you edit and edit and edit. And that's what I do. And that's what we all do. Uh, and so... Again, one of the things, I think I mentioned this already, but they would do notes, which in the film history means you're looking at a partial movie, you get feedback, and the feedback in Pixar was never mandatory. It was always like, this is a recommendation, and which was good because then the creators, the directors did not get defensive. They didn't say, oh my God, no, you're totally wrong. No, they actually thought about it, and because it was like, a gentle form of persuasion, a lot of times they were convinced anyway. And it was a good way to have the, you know, minds meet and so on. They also pushed the idea that weird ideas are okay, which was my favorite part of this, I think. The, there's a thing called the elevator test. You're supposed to be able to pitch your project, you know, within a, a few seconds at an elevator. You know, you, find, you meet an editor or somebody or a producer in the case of movies. And uh, you're supposed to be able to describe it very quickly. Well, sometimes it's not easy, like Up, which was an award-winning movie. But they said, well, it's about a aging widower who's depressed, and he ties a bunch of balloons to his house, and he it lifts off the off the foundation. And he has all these adventures, and the uh, producer would say, huh? <laughs> uh, so, in in the writing world, we have a thing called comps. We're supposed to compare our book to two recent books of a similar genre 
but not too popular <laughs> and uh, within the last couple of years and it's very stultifying because sometimes we have an original idea and sometimes it's based on some topic that's much older which the publishers don't think they can sell well sometimes you know things become a big hit like harry potter or hunger games that probably wouldn't have been considered unless somebody took a chance on them finally they brought up the idea of different creative processes and different mental models that people have interestingly enough catmull has an affliction called aphantasia which is the inability to form pictures in his mind i know it sounds unbelievable i am plagued by pictures in my mind if i see like a horror movie one of the reasons i don't see them very often because these images are hard to get out of my head <laughs> and it's weird because catmull has some artistic ability he can draw but he says he starts with an emotion and not a picture which is strange the next part topic five the ideology and this is the part i didn't like uh, it, I think it started when uh, Pixar got acquired by Disney. And Disney has become quite a woke corporation. And in 2018, however, Pixar had a thing they called Notes Day, which they thought, we'll take the idea of critique from notes from a film to the entire company, and we're going to get input from all the employees on all of our processes and policies. So a lot of them were good ideas. Some were you know, whiny ideas like, why can't I bring my dog to work every day? <laughs> and others were woke ideas. Because like most companies, they had this uh, mission statement of promoting diversity. And some of the, the uh, people said, you're not doing enough. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of scorekeeping, which is what I hate about this in the woke world. It's like, well, they had lots of female producers, which they did, but we didn't have any full-fledged uh, leading female directors at all. So we need some. Well, no, you don't. You, you, you need them if they appear and they're good, but you don't have to force it. That's what I, what I say. At the same time, it was nice that they said, okay, well, here are these artists who want to become directors, these female artists, and they want to have a help group where they're going to discuss how they can become noticed and the company supported them and some of them did become full-time directors and that's fantastic but it came from the employees it came from them not from a top-down matter now the worst idea in my view is equity it's a very poisonous idea that's infected the business world that is the idea that results should be the same regardless it kind of comes from a, a notion that if one group has less representation than the other, it's got to be because of discrimination <laughs> or an unfriendly environment. You know, if fewer women are engineering, it's because we engineers are sexist. Well, not necessarily. It may be because men and women tend to think differently. A case in point, according to the American Veterinary Medical Association, as of 2020, 63% of America's practicing veterinarians are female. And this proportion is increasing. Like engineering, this is a challenging profession, but women apparently find this to be a more rewarding career path. Is this a bad thing? I think not. And uh, it's never like we've said, we don't want female engineers. I have never said that for certain, but that's the idea behind equity. And so one of the things that happened was two female artists came in and said, we saw a study that said that 70% of all the characters in cartoon crowd scenes has historically been male. Who does this? Who has time to count the characters? Again, scorekeeping. And so the management said, okay, we'll make a policy. From now on, 50% of all crowd scenes must be female unless there's a story reason for it not to be. Well, to me, <laughs> this is kind of the opposite of creative freedom. This is imposing a rule on their creators uh, because of the message as critical drinker would say and uh, so to me it's a problem and it is a bad bad omen for pixar being corrupted by the um, woke ideology so i mean diversity just doesn't make a difference in most businesses it's whatever whoever the best people are whatever their background although to be fair Pixar produces content for all audiences, 
And so if they figure somebody with a different viewpoint could have a better you know, creative idea, that does make sense. But <laughs> there was a controversy, of course, by some of their woke stuff. In 2022, the fifth Toy Story movie, Lightyear, came out, and there were LGBT themes in there. <laughs> this was a big problem in their foreign markets. There was a same-sex kiss, and there was also a trans teenager poster in one of the backgrounds. Now, this was a problem in Russia, in China, in uh, the Arab world. And originally, Pixar was going to take them out for those markets. But came Florida with the bill that banned uh, LGBT propaganda for <laughs> early grades. And they got into a pissing contest and said, no, we're going to put them back in all markets, <laughs> which really hurt their foreign distribution. A lot of countries didn't want to take it or they made it adults only. Can you believe that? From the viewpoint of somebody who has written gay characters, yes, I have, I see this as so counterproductive to try and shove this ideology down the throats of other countries. Uh, and now I think this is why Russia banned any pro uh, versions of gay people in, in anything, because they were so tired of the Americans, you know, and their rainbow flags. And I think that's really accomplished some negative stuff that probably wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been so obnoxious about it. Be persuasive, you know, be gentle. Eventually, they may come around. And so certainly my book, Fidelis Automata, which has a gay main character, would be banned in Russia. I have no doubt, unfortunately. I didn't want to end on a negative note, but instead I'm going to end on a sad note. Uh, this is topic number six, the eulogy. Now, as most of you probably know, Steve Jobs died of pancreatic cancer a few years back. And he was a very brave fighter. You know, he beat the odds that he survived eight years after the diagnosis, which is unusual. And uh, Catmull was a good friend of his, and he wanted to, you know, clear the record about what Steve Jobs was really like. A lot of the biographies paint him as a very abrasive and obnoxious and rude character who was very stubborn and, and single-minded. And he said, no, there were other sides to him. He was also very warm, very very open, very uh, driven, passionate, and accepting uh, in a lot of ways. And as he got older, he mellowed, and he became a lot less abrasive. And that without Jobs, Pixar absolutely could not have survived. Now, Ed Catmull does his own narration in this. Usually not a good idea, but I think he does a passable job. And his voice actually cracks a bit in this part of it, because you can tell he's feeling emotional especially when they did the memorial at, at Pixar uh, for Steve. Even, I'm getting, <laughs> even I get a little emotional because, you know, I think about I lost my mom, you know, a year ago. So it makes me emotional, too, uh, from this view. But anyway, this has been my review of Creativity, Inc., Overcoming the Unseen Forces that Stand in the Way of in True Inspiration by Ed Catmull. <laughs> Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Uh, please like and subscribe so you can get out the good steampunk science fiction animation squirt. <laughs> and yeah, I'd, also, I'd like to get a little feedback on what are your favorite Pixar movies? Uh, what are your least favorite? Did you watch Lightyear? Did you think that it was that big of a deal? Probably not, but other countries, they may think that. Please check out my fiction on Amazon. I've included a list of the links in the description, as always. And this includes my notorious gay characters. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.